the idea is it's, it really is going to be a conversation, kind of like you would have in your own home. I'm going to ask Catherine questions for maybe the first half hour, and then we'll have 45 minutes for each of you to ask the questions that will allow us a time to, you know, dig into issues. And, and I know Catherine is going to be interested in, in discussing the details of the climate science that she works on, but she'll also hopefully talk to you about the, the way that she has been so effective at, at reaching people. But let me say just a couple of words of, about Catherine, She's a really distinguished scientist and professor of political science at Texas Tech University. Published, you know, over a hundred technical papers on on details of the way the climate system works. She's been deeply involved in in uh, all of the major U.S. climate assessments and in some regional assessments. Actually, Catherine and I started working together about 20 years ago on on uh, the first regional climate assessment for California. And Catherine's real expertise is in in uh, high resolution assessments of of the climate changes that that impact people, ecosystems, and economies locally. She's made a big impact with the science, but she's made an even bigger impact in science communication. And I would say that Catherine's really a, a pioneer in meeting people where they are, trying to understand what are the channels that can open a meaningful dialogue about climate, even when you come from very different places. And she's been especially effective at reaching out to communities of faith, and we'll have a chance to talk about that more. You know, I, usually when I when I introduce people for these conversations, I I go through this big list of awards, and Catherine has a big list of awards. But the the nature of of her involvement with the global community has been has been much more in the kinds of dialogues we're having here, and just to to characterize the effectiveness with which she's done that. Catherine has approximately twice as many Twitter followers as the World Meteorological Organization. <laughs> and I think that puts it in context more clearly than anything else I can say. So I'll take that. Thank you. <laughs> no, I, I, I think you should. The, the World Meteorological Organization represents you know, thousands of, of uh, climate researchers around the world, and they, uh, yeah, they ended up with half as many Twitter followers as Catherine. So, uh, you know, let me start, and, and maybe you could just say a couple of words to set the stage about your philosophy of climate communication. What is it that you're trying to accomplish, and, and how do you think about starting the difficult conversations? Sure. So, how is this microphone? Or this microphone? Okay, number two. All right. Uh, my philosophy is this. Just about every single person on this planet already cares about a changing climate. They just haven't connected the dots. And that's very different than the perspective that we often have that they don't care, they need to care, they should care, we have to make them care. It's really hard to make somebody care about something that they don't already care about if they're not your child under the age of about 10. As a very limited window we have to shape people's values and is one of the most precious things and one of the most big, biggest responsibilities we have as a parent. But if we consider climate change, um, why do we care about it? We care about it because it affects the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the food that we eat. It affects the resources that are available to us that we use in every single thing in our daily lives. It affects the economy jobs, national security, international relations, um, the political stability of failing states, refugee crisis, the health of the ocean, our ecosystems, the places where we love spending time, where we enjoy, that replenish our souls. It affects every aspect of life on this planet. So to be somebody who cares about a changing climate, the only thing we have to be is somebody who lives on this planet who cares about ourselves, our family, our friends, our community, our neighbors, people we know, the natural environment. And so my philosophy is that I'm not trying to make anybody other than who they are. I'm trying to show people to hold up a mirror almost to say who you are is already the perfect person to care. And in fact, acting on climate is not only not incompatible with who you are, 
But acting on climate actually allows you to genuinely express your personal and unique identity in an even truer and more um, obvious manner than you already have before. So it enhances and reinforces your identity acting on climate rather than the message we so often hear today, which is that it's somehow counter to or in opposition to who I am. That's really interesting. And, and when, you, when you think about this challenge of, of meeting people where they are, do, do you think the main challenge is opening their eyes to the issue or getting them to the stage where they'll actually make changes in their investments and their lifestyle that are moving the needle? Definitely the latter. Because you could have people who say, absolutely, I 100% agree with the science. And if they're not doing anything, it's just the same as if they don't agree. So it, it isn't accepting the science. It's actually moving towards action that matters. And I think that connecting the dots between people's values and not only caring about climate, but acting on climate is the most important thing we can do. And, and what's the secret to making people feel empowered? Is there, is, is the, is the challenge that people feel like only big, big things make a difference or somebody else is responsible for turning the dial on emissions? Or is it that, um, that they haven't really thought enough about the steps that individuals can take that collectively add up? That's a good question, and we could probably go for days <laughs> kind of debating and discussing that. But I, th I think the root of the issue is we understand, most of us do, just about all of us actually do understand instinctively that climate change is this huge global issue. We have almost 8 billion people on the planet. And so we're told about this huge global issue. And we have words that are tossed around these days like extinction and doom and you know end of the world. And then... We're told to change our light bulbs and recycle. And we instinctively know that those solutions aren't going to save the world. <laughs> so there's this huge disconnect between what we feel we can do. And what, what the social science has been finding recently is that what, what um, correlates with our support for an engagement in action is our own personal sense of efficacy. In other words, if we feel empowered, if we feel like we can make a difference. And so that's why I, I've really had a a 10-year journey in terms of how to answer the question that I get asked whenever I talk about climate science, which is, what should I do? Because when I first got asked that, I was like, how am I supposed to know? I'm a scientist. We diagnose the problem. I can tell you exactly how bad it is and how worse it's going to get. But I don't fix it. I'm not an engineer, an entrepreneur, a business person, an activist. So. I had to try to figure out, well, what should people do? So I was like, well, I think stepping on the carbon scales, measuring our carbon footprint, understanding that we all lead different lives, but looking at how our life produces carbon and sensible steps we could do to reduce our carbon footprint, which for one person, it might be transportation. For another person, it might be diet. For another person, it might be your living circumstances. For me, it's flying. But then that's inherently unsatisfactory too, because even if we reduce everything we can, we know not everybody is doing that, and we know that's not enough to fix the problem either. We know that we also need system-wide change. We know that only 100 corporations have produced 70% of emissions since the beginning of the industrial era. We need system-wide change, but what is the system made up of? It's made up of people. So that's why, Looking at public opinion data, looking at how many people agree that climate is changing, it will affect plants, animals, future generations, people in developing countries, yeah, even people in the United States. People are mostly yes on those issues. And then you say, do you think it will affect you? All of a sudden, nosedive. Nobody's connected the dots between their impacts personally yet, although we're certainly starting to, right? Especially here in California. Yeah, I think here in California, you yeah, exactly. Get that yeah. Impression. Well, according to the public opinion surveys, as of last year, the majority still have not. As of last year, which is kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, I think the numbers are going up. I definitely think so. But the darkest blue map of these Yale public opinion maps is when they ask people, "Do you ever talk about it?" And it turns out nobody ever does. So I really think the most effective thing we can do is talk about why it matters to us and what we can do to fix it, which includes individual action. It includes new technology. It includes what's happening in unexpected places. Those are the best stories. 
I have great stories about Texas if you're interested in, but also good stories about what's happening in China or India or Sub-Saharan Africa, about things that we can do ourselves, about things that corporations are doing, things that the military is doing, things that tribal nations are doing, things that the university is doing and other campuses are doing. Talk about solutions, advocate for solutions, join an organization that amplifies our voice, and also vote. Because how do we affect system-wide changes by voting? I don't just mean in federal elections. We vote for lots of little elections. At the university, you can vote. You can vote in organizations that you belong to, scientific societies. You can vote as a shareholder in corporations. There's a lot of voting that could happen that could really start to move the needle in different areas, I think. I, I, I totally agree that uh, in, in future elections, the most important thing is to get everyone to vote. But I'd like to talk about the where you probably had the biggest impact, which is, at least it seems to me, in communities of faith and helping those communities recognize that this is part of their core interest and it's not a side interest. And speak about how, how that's come about and, and what the process has been like for bringing communities of faith sort of into the understanding that lets them be involved as, as activists. So for communities of faith, it's the same as with any other group. And that is that we need to take the values that people already have and respect those values and appreciate those values and then say, hey, because of who you are already, you're the perfect person to care. Because here, let me explain to you how climate change affects what you already care about. So for example, as Christians, Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, as people of the Jewish faith as well, you know that the first chapter in the Bible, for example, says that God has given humans responsibility over every living thing on this planet. And then in the second chapter, it talks about how we are to be stewards or caretakers to tend the garden, to care for, to have responsibility over. And then if you go all the way to the end of the Bible, there's a nice little verse about how God will destroy those who destroy the earth. Most people stop reading before they get to that verse. <laughs> a lot of people have missed that. It was actually pointed out to me by an ecologist, by Cal DeWitt. He's the one who knew that verse. Um, and then talking about how climate change disproportionately affects the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world. That's a core value that a lot of us have, that we understand there's injustice. We understand that those of us who have um, been given the most have a responsibility to care for those who haven't. And so connecting the dots between the values that people have already have and how cl a changing climate affects those exact values and how acting on it makes you exactly who you are and an even more authentic version of who you are, that's how I think we motivate that action. So I have a lot of challenges I run into and I, I love the challenges the best. When you get an invitation, a phone call or an email where it goes something like this. So apparently you spoke at X Baptist College and I heard it was all right. So if you're interested, and you can tell from their tone of voice, they're hoping you'll say no. If you're interested, you could come and give a chapel service here. Please say no, please say no, please say no. <laughs> I'm like, yes, <laughs> I will be there. Um, those are my favorite invitations. And so I have ended up in some really challenging and unexpected places. And but I, the, my run rule is this, if I can't figure out a way to truly connect with, appreciate, and share the values of that group, I don't think I should be there. I'm not the right person to be talking to them. Somebody else can have that conversation in the future, not me. But I was invited to speak to a oil and gas company in Texas. Not one of the big multinationals, but one of the, kind of the, the second tier ones that are really big, and they're based in Texas. And so I was invited to speak to their entire leadership team. And they even said in the invitation, our chief geologist is not invited because he's the guy who'll give you all the grief. So we've actually de-invited him because we just want to hear from you what the real deal is. So I had to think about that really carefully because I thought, well, what value do they have that I genuinely share and appreciate? And if I can't identify that, I should not go. So I thought about it, and this is what I realized. I realized I'm profoundly grateful for fossil fuels. If it weren't for the Industrial Revolution, I would have lived a very short, very unpleasant, very brutal life. I likely would have died as a child. If not as a child, I would have died in childbirth. 
I wouldn't have received an education. I really wonder what it'd be like to live without glasses. I've actually thought about that. <laughs> I might have had glasses 300 years ago, but it depends how rich we were. Yes. So I realized that I am profoundly grateful for the benefits that fossil fuel has brought my life and continues to do so. I flew here on an airplane that burned fossil fuels. And not only that, but fossil, fuel enables, fossil fuels enabled us to free ourselves from slavery. And I am profoundly grateful for that. That played a key role in enabling the North to win over the South, the industrialization due to fossil fuels. And not only that, but there's a billion people in the world who don't have energy. And those people live much shorter lives than we do. They spend much more of their time on the basic necessities of life than we do. They do not have the luxuries of education and free time and entertainment that we do and travel and all the other things that I appreciate about life. So I went to that company and rather than starting with, you know, ice core data, <laughs> I started with just sharing with them that I was really grateful for what the service they provided. That I knew that they worked hard, it was not an easy life, it was not an easy job, and they, did, they worked really hard to give us the energy we needed to provide us with our lifestyle. And when I said that, the faces opened. They're like, you get it. That's exactly how we feel, and we need energy. I was like, yes, we do need energy. And so we had a great, you know, five, 10 minute interaction. No, no, no. And then they're like, okay, now tell us about climate change. We were only scheduled to talk for about half an hour. We ended up talking for two hours. They had so many questions about the science, about the data, about what was happening in the future. And then by the end of the conversation, they're like, well, what should we do? We want to be in business in 30 years. How can we still be in business with the way the world is going? What are, you know, how can, I'm like, well, you are the experts in that. I'm certainly happy to help, but you're the experts in how to do this. And so we had a fantastic conversation that ended up with them actually talking about how can we transition our company to still provide the energy people need in the future and we're able to do that because we're able to genuinely connect at the beginning. And so that, for me, personally, was a huge learning experience. You know, I, I, I really respect that. And my, my sense is that we're at a place with climate where what we're really talking about is the clock more than whether or not we're going to take action. And, and you know, we're, we're, you know, oil and gas companies are at our various places along the spectrum of whether they think that is a 10-year clock or a 20-year clock or a 100-year clock. And, um, and, and when you interact with people all the way from uh, small churches in rural Texas to oil and gas companies, how, how do you talk about the time that we have available and the urgency of the actions that are required? Yes. Well, actually, I'd like your answer on that one, too if you don't mind. I'll give you my thoughts, but I want to hear what you say too. Um, this is a difficult one, and it's, it's risen to the forefront in the last year, because when the IPC's one and a half degree report was published last October, it looked at emission pathways that would take us to a one and a half degree future. Now, from the perspective of the climate system, what the climate system cares about is cumulative carbon emissions. If you produce all those emissions in one year, if you produce them over 10 years, if you produce them over 15 years, that doesn't matter that much. What matters is the cumulative, okay? But as humans, we have to divide those cumulative emissions up by year, because you can't just go from this to zero in one year. So the one and a half degree report had different emission pathways, like this much this year, this much this year, this much this year, that would take us to one and a half degrees. And they said, for example, if we reduce our emissions by what percent by 2030 was it again? Most people are saying 50 50 percent, 50 percent by 2030, that that would take us to a one and a half degree future. Well, somehow that got turned into we have 12 years left before we all die. And you still hear 12 years, even though it's still it's 11 years now. <laughs> and that that isn't true. But what we do know is, just like there's no magic number of cigarettes we can smoke and not get lung cancer, like imagine if you smoke 9,999 cigarettes, but as long as you don't smoke the 10,000th cigarette, you're fine. I mean, we all know instinctively that's not the way it works, but somehow it's like we're told that if we emit this much carbon, but just, just at this level, it's all okay, and if we just go a tiny bit over or just, you know, to one day past the 12 years, we're all screwed. That's not true. But what we do know is the more cigarettes we smoke, the greater the risks. And the faster we wean ourselves off smoking, the better off we are. Same way with carbon. 
The more carbon we produce, the greater the risks. But I study the future. What I specifically study, and the very first project that Chris and I worked on together for the state of California, was to quantify the difference between a high fossil fuel future versus a clean energy future. And for the state of California, we documented the impacts on water supply, on specialty crops, on air pollution, and more. And what that showed is that our choices today will have a profound impact on our future. Some amount of impacts are inevitable. They've already happened. It's like you've been smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for a decade or more. But you don't have lung cancer. You don't have emphysema. You're certainly not dead yet. <laughs> There's a lot we can do to ensure that the future is better, not worse, than the future that we face today. What would you say? Well, you know, I, I totally agree with that. The, the thing that I, I find most frustrating about these clock discussions now is that there's an increasing amount of emphasis on what I think of as the magic wand solutions, that we will be able to activate large amounts of negative emissions in the latter decades of the century, and that that somehow provides a license to continue high emissions for the next few decades. And um, there, there are many historical epics where this kind of uh, technology optimism has dug us into a very deep hole, and I, I feel like a lot of times our narrative about climate is, it's maybe not digging the hole, but it's kind of opening the pathway to it. Yeah. And in terms of those magic wand solutions, can you just describe a couple of those? Oh, you know, the, the one that gets talked about the most is called bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, the idea that we could uh, grow a forest, chop it down, throw the trees into a combustion power plant, capture the CO2 as it's coming out the smokestack, and then inject that CO2 into underground geological formations. You get electricity out and, and a net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. That would probably work at some scale, but we have no idea. We, there, there's one factory that's doing it to produce ethanol in Illinois, probably have visited, and um, it's doing a million tons per year, which sounds like a big number, but it's about a one hundredth of a percent of what would need to be done in order to have this work at scale. And so uh, the, the, you know, the challenge is in order to grow enough biomass to do all this, you would need to allocate an additional amount of land approximately equal to the total amount of cropland we have now around the whole world by about 2050. And, and you know, it's one of these solutions, uh, quote, solutions where you say, well, if we destroy the biosphere, we could have a climate that's consistent with saving the biosphere. And, uh, you know, it just doesn't add up. No. All right. And, and let's, you know, elephant in the room here, Chris. What about solar radiation management? We were, just, yeah. we were talking about yeah. solar geoengineering on the way over. I, I, uh, true confessions, I, I'm chairing a National Academies Committee on Solar Geoengineering where the question is, is this something we should even research? The idea is that we know we have terrible challenges with climate change. We know it's been historically a gargantuan challenge to move away from the fossil fuel economy that's continuing to emit these greenhouse gases. And we know from observations that past volcanic eruptions have resulted in sufficient pollution of the stratosphere to cool the global climate. And so the speculation is, well, maybe if we put a bunch of this sulfur dioxide pollution in the stratosphere, we could cool the climate. And it is incredibly hubristic uh, technology optimist approach where I think that um, the narrative that it's likely to be quick and easy is what you would think if you had only thought about the problem for five minutes or if you said, well, the decisions that people make and the decisions that societies make in terms of implementation and liability and the international interactions don't play a big role. So, you know, my, my sense is that we're in a world now where the renewable options are cheap and effective and where, in contrast to the speculation that solar geoengineering might be cheap and simple, that it's actually likely to be expensive and complicated. I mean, what's your sense? Um, my concern is that um, 
we, we haven't studied this enough. I mean, there really hasn't been hardly any funding to even study it. And so if you employ something like that without sufficient studying, it's like taking a drug that has not even been submitted to the FDA for approval and administering it to every human being on the planet at the same time. Now, if, you, if, if you're desperate enough, you might do it, but the side effects could be who knows what. So um, I think mo many of our colleagues that, that I've spoken to about this, and you would know more than I, I think we, we favor studying it because as scientists, we want to understand something. And I think we should understand it because it could be done by another country. Um, but I think the more we understand it, the more we understand that it is one of those kind of much more complicated and potentially risky things. Yeah, well, I mean, while we're on the topic of complicated subjects, yeah. one of the things yeah. I hear- Good segue. And, you know, like everything. <laughs> Uh, one of the things I hear most frequently from advocates for slower action in the U.S. is that, well, you know, the U.S. isn't the biggest emitter and our emissions growing most rapidly in China and India and rapidly developing parts of the world. And, and how do you think about addressing that, you know, resistance action to, to, to the kinds of steps that should be taken in the rich world? Well, so something interesting that I've noticed, because I hear that argument quite a bit, is that I hear the same argument in every country. <laughs> Canada is only 2% of global emissions. The European Union is only whatever, whatever. Norway is just a small country. Everybody says that they're not the problem. And if you even went to China, what I would say, if I was Chinese, is I would say, well, what really matters is cumulative emissions. And when you look at cumulative emissions, the United States is number one by a long shot, more than double China still. And then when you look at per capita emissions, per person emissions, then you've got the US, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada right up there at the top. So every single country that I've been to says the same thing. And that's why climate change is so hard to fix because it is a tragedy of the commons. That was a concept that was identified back, I think, in the 1960s, and it was based on the idea of the shared pasture land that English villages used to share. So everybody wants to farm as many animals as they can on the shared pasture because then you benefit. If I have five goats and my neighbor has two, I'm getting more out of the pasture. But if we overgraze the pasture, there's nothing left for anybody and it completely collapses. So there has to be some common management of the system, like you're only allowed to put one cow and one goat or three goats on the pasture. Otherwise, it collapses for everybody. And what we're seeing is exactly that, the tragedy of the commons. Everybody points the finger at someone else. And so how do I counter that? I um, try to collect, and um, I would always like to collect more of these. I try to collect stories of what is happening in those other places. So I collect stories of what is happening in Texas, as well as California. I collect stories of what's happening in India and China, what's happening in Canada, including Alberta, what's happening in really unexpected places to show that there is climate action happening in these places. And I think that every single time I tell any of these stories, every single time, whoever I'm talking to is surprised. Because we all think that nobody's doing anything except us. And they even did surveys quite a while ago about recycling where they went down the block and they asked each house if they recycle. And then they asked, who, who else do you think recycles on the block? And it turned out that almost every, like the majority of people said they recycled, but the majority thought that nobody else recycled. You know what I mean? So we have this human tendency to think that we're doing all this stuff and nobody else is doing anything. So sharing stories of what other countries are doing is very powerful. And even showing that we're falling behind compared to what some other countries are doing is really incredibly powerful. Let me just ask one more question and then I'm going to turn it over to all of you. So you should be thinking about the questions you want to ask. And I'd like to just dig a little more on this issue we're on now, which is really the the question of fairness in climate responses. And, and one possible approach to fairness is you should base it on the cumulative emissions as we've mm -hmm. hinted. Another is that you should base it on um, wealth and capacity to act. Mm -hmm. Another kind of argument is that you should base the motivation on the um, sort of opportunities for technology leadership and future economic mm -hmm. growth. and. Uh, and the third is that it, uh, it really has 
more of a kind of a deep moral or ethical or religious grounding, and it's just you should do the thing that's right for the planet. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you think about it? And which of those arguments do you find most useful? And how do you think about allocating between those, particularly in a world where you know, we not only need to find a way to decarbonize, but we also need to find a way to invest in adaptation to the climate changes mm -hmm. that are already occurred or are baked into the system. Yeah. That is the toughest question. And I've actually spent quite a bit of time looking at that because I used to work a lot with emission scenarios for the future. And I mean, ultimately, ultimately, the only fair thing to end up on ultimately is equal emissions per capita. Because otherwise, we're saying that a human is valued differently depending on where they are. But then you could say, but I live in a place that's a nice temperate climate, so I don't need a lot of heating or air conditioning. And then this person lives in Alaska, and they do need a lot of heating, so you know. So then you start to be like, oh, OK, well, then maybe the metric is you know, this adjusted by that. And then, <laughs> then you're like, yeah, but in this region, we eat this type of diet. In this region, we eat a different cultural diet. So you're saying that I have to change my cultural diet because there's a different carbon footprint. So you get into a mess even very quickly with just that. So I liken the international agreements to a potluck dinner. At a potluck dinner, everybody brings something different to the table. But you need enough on the table to feed everybody. And right now, we don't have enough on the table commitments from every country to feed, feed everybody. But what we do have is we have a system where every country can make up their own contributions. So some countries have decided that they're going to do um, agricultural solutions, carbon sequestration, reforestation. That's what they're focusing on for their contributions, some of them very successfully. Others have decided that electrification is the, is the answer. Others have decided that they're going to put a policy in place and let the chips fall where they may, like in Canada, price on carbon. So each country is bringing their own dish to the table. And I feel like that actually has much more of a hope than some international organization trying to inst instill some type of mandatory whatever, because that's not going to work. I mean, there's no teeth to that at all. There's no teeth even to the Paris Agreement. So I'm actually in favor of this potluck approach. But if we can actually get people to show up with enough food to feed everybody, which is in my analogy, enough carbon emissions to meet their Paris commitments. Great. Thanks so much. Mm. So uh, let me turn it over to all of you. Uh, please keep the questions short and question-like. Uh, Athena, are there, are there additional microphones? OK. And I see one, there's a, there's a whole bunch of questions. You, you may pick the questioner. Thank you. Um, Peter Hess from Berkeley, and uh, Catherine, I actually quote you in my uh, Climate Abandoned book that came out last April in an, an article that I wrote on religion and climate change. Yeah. And the question I have is why the elephant in the room of overpopulation has not even been mentioned today. And I would like to put that in the context of the work I'm doing with lots of younger people who've joined the climate birth strike that is, we will not have children until climate is, is solved. Mm -hmm. um, whether you have any comments on that issue, please. Sure. Uh, well, my first question is, uh, why do I not have a copy of the book? <laughs> but um, with all due respect, the question you just asked, why is overpopulation never mentioned? I hear that once a week on social media. And my response is, we have a global weirding episode about this. <laughs> so people are talking about overpopulation. But what I say is this. If you look at, an Oxfam did this work, if you look at who produces the emissions, 10% of the world produces 50% of the emissions. So it is not a case of overpopulation per se. It is a case of the unequitable allocation of resources. Now that said, I don't know if you're, most of you are probably familiar with Project Drawdown, for example. And it, I like it because it lists all these different solutions to climate change to kind of give us the diversity of the solutions. In their top 10, they have two key solutions, which I think address the issue without mentioning the word overpopulation. Because forgive me, but overpopulation translates directly in my brain and a lot of other people's brains to population control, which translates to somebody telling me what I can do with my body, which translates right into something else. <laughs> so with all due respect, um, they're, they're the so two solutions that address this issue directly are, first of all, obviously, family planning. We take it so for granted that we have family planning. Many of the places where the birth rate is highest, they don't even have it. So it's not like you're trying to impose control. You're just trying to give people the choice because they don't have a choice. 
And as a woman, having that choice is really, really important. But the second thing they have there is education of women and girls. Because did you know that the more educated a woman is, even including just basic elementary school, the lower the mortality rate of her children. And so instead of having 10 children and losing eight of them to before the age of five, you have children who actually grow and thrive who you are able to support. And you don't need as many children and you're often able to access the resources you need to ensure you don't have 12 children because you have three healthy, flourishing children instead of multiple children who have to do all the work that you need them to do because you don't have access to the resources that you would get. So I think the conversation absolutely needs to happen, but it needs to happen using words and frames that empower women and give women the choice rather than trying to impose some kind of top-down solution, even by implication. You, you can pick Jerry's. <laughs> but pick some of the people in the front later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, say, and please say your name. I'm Tony Chan. Uh, some countries like uh, Singapore is implementing greening of their urban cities. Uh, if a lot of countries does the same, not, not only uh, it's equivalent to CO2, but also make it uh, more aesthetic. And it seems that Singapore had a very successful program if um, you have been there. And also there are scientific R&D in breeding plants and trees to be more efficient in mm -hmm. sequestering CO2 and release more oxygen. Uh, what do you think is the impact if uh, most countries uh, would implement such program? Um, well, let me comment on that first, and I'd like Chris's comment too, especially on um, urban ecology. I think that'd be really helpful. So cities are really key in our forward momentum towards climate solutions. At the Paris Agreement, which was countries, the, the mayor of Paris actually hosted the cities in the city. And the cities are where, I mean, you have the mayor's climate action plans, you have, um, or the mayor's climate commitment, you have C40, you have the Rockefeller Resilient Cities. Our populations are becoming increasingly urbanized, and cities are vulnerable to climate impacts because of the high population density and infrastructure, but cities are also where we can implement so many of the positive solutions, including smart transportation, smart infrastructure, um, city planning, um, even urban forests. And there's this really cool program called Cities for Forests that are all about developing urban forests, adjacent forests, and connecting with remote forests, kind of like you have sister cities, you have a sister forest instead. Um, not only that, but we know that having um, plants, trees, ecosystems inside a city carries enormous co-benefits, right? There's air quality, uh, uh, air quality improvement. There's also just the the idea that when we're surrounded by nature as opposed to hard lines, it actually does something to us that we're just starting to understand, that exposure to nature actually affects us profoundly from small children all the way on up. So I think there's, that cities are really a powerful place to act, and that's why the last few years, my research and my work has focused almost primarily on cities. I do the part about building resilience to a changing climate. I'm working with the city of Houston right now. Um, but then they nearly always partner the work I do looking at adaptation with a mitigation plan, looking again at smart transportation strategies, at changing building codes, at doing things that actually improve the quality of life of people in the city, but also make that city much more sustainable for the future. Chris. Yeah, you know, that's a great answer. The only thing I would add is that there's often a temptation to say, well, maybe we can solve this problem with nature alone. Mm -hmm. Natural climate mm -hmm. solutions are kind of the hottest thing out there now. And, and there's no question that we could dramatically decrease the forcing of climate change by stopping cutting down forests, doing a better job of managing the forests we have. But it's also very clear that we can't solve the whole problem. So planting trees, stewarding nature, key part of the solution, but not the whole solution. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's get a question from the very front. And then the very back. You guys have been very quiet. No hands up in the very back. Oh, OK, good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Linda Marin, Santa Cruz, um, and Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, it sounds like, from everything you have said, that you accept that the 1.5 degree centigrade um, goal is adequate. And I'm wondering no, if... we didn't say that. Okay, no. it's, but, 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 but that we must stay, that's our standard, that we're trying to stay 
within that guideline. I, I, maybe you would want to clarify mm -hmm. that because it's sounding like that to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would love to hear what you think about that. Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that and for clarifying too. Um, so here's the thing. There's no magic number. There isn't. And in fact, we have a global wording episode literally called that, <laughs> if you're interested. There is no magic number. So if we end up at 1.499 degrees, it doesn't mean that everything's OK. And if we ended up at 1.5001 degrees, it doesn't mean we're all screwed. Same thing goes for two degrees. They're just a threshold that we picked because we need some target. What we know as scientists is some of the impacts are already here. And for some people, those impacts are already dangerous today, not in the future. So for some people, including tribal nations in Louisiana, Alaska, and around the Arctic, who are having to abandon their lands already, and including many islands in the South Pacific, it is already dangerous. For people who, who lost their homes or even their lives in these disasters, they're becoming increasingly supersized by a changing climate, where you have Hurricane Harvey, where 40% of the rain that fell during Hurricane Harvey was supercharged by a warming planet, where you have double the area being burned by wildfires in California as a result of a warmer, drier conditions, where you have the, the 2003 heat wave in Europe that killed 70,000 people, 70,000. And we know that the risk of that heat wave already that long ago had already doubled as a result of a changing climate. So dangerous is already here for many people. But we also know that the more carbon we produce, the more dangerous it gets. So my personal threshold is as little as possible, cut the carbon as fast as possible, as low as possible. But I do know this, that every bit counts too. So rather than saying, oh my gosh, we're not going to make one and a half degrees, let's just give up. No. Because 1.6 is a lot better than 1.7. And 1.7 is better than 1.8. So we know that the more we produce, the worse it is. The faster we cut emissions, the better off we'll, are, we'll be. But at the same time, we also know that there's no magic switch. And I know there's really smart people right here at Stanford working to make magic switches, <laughs> all kinds of magic switches. <laughs> but we don't have any magic switches, especially not only natural solutions like you were saying. So it's this balance. Because if we shut off every source of fossil fuels in the world today, the immediate suffering would actually be tremendous too. So it's this incredibly difficult balance. And where does the optimal balance lie? I don't think that physical scientists can answer that question. I don't think any of us can answer the question until after it's happened when you know, hindsight is, is 2020. So I'm so glad you asked that question because it's a really important question. And it's not meant to discourage us, but rather encourage us that everything we do matters. It counts and it will make a difference. Great. Uh, you, is there a question in the very back? Try and be cosmopolitan in our approach here. As a representative of the people in the back, I, <laughs> um, I, I like so much of uh, what I've heard you say, uh, Catherine. And um, one of the things I noted was about the uh, carbon footprint. And um, I don't know if everybody in the room has looked at their own, but one way to find out is go to Cool Carol California. Uh, I think it's .arb.gov, but Cool California will get you there. You can figure out your own household mm -hmm. carbon footprint, and then they give you, uh, I think it's four um, ways to take action. Mm -hmm. uh, airplanes, agriculture, automobiles, and the household HVAC system. Uh, I was, as, in terms of a question, I was wondering, how have you uh, experienced talking about carbon footprints and people's uh, you know, personal uh, um, plan of action, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think that it's really helpful to provide practical, concrete examples, rather than saying kind of nebulously we should all reduce our carbon footprint, to give people a concrete thing they can do. So, and it's really helpful when you can tie that concrete thing to collective action. So for example, if every home in the US replaced an incandescent with an LED, that would be like taking almost a million cars off the road. So that's a pretty powerful statement. That's an old statement. The newer statement I heard was this one. I heard this in Texas from an electric power guy. And I don't know if you know, but in Texas, our power is a lot cheaper than yours. A lot. This is what he said. He calculated. He said, if you buy an LED for $1.50, which you can now, and someone gives you an incandescent bulb for free, 
in Texas, where our power is, again, substantially cheaper than yours, after three months, you'll be paying more for the incandescent than you pay for the LED. So that's a pretty powerful statement there. You're like, oh, now I understand why. And then in terms of diet, it's like many people, when you say go vegan, they kind of get deer in the headlights look, right? I mean, that's a big challenge to go from a normal diet to a vegan. So you're just like, meatless Monday. Just do meatless Monday. And then once you started to do a bit of meatless stuff, you're like, OK, that wasn't so bad. I found a good recipe. We tried that out. It was actually delicious. Oh, I have something else I'd like to do. Before you know it, you're doing meatless Monday and Thursday. You know what I mean? So you're breaking it off into small, manageable chunks. Um, in terms of bigger things, so I, I live in Texas. Everybody really does drive the big GMC Yukons there, pretty much, right? Or slightly smaller ones. But um, on our street, everybody drives really big cars. And I got a plug-in car a few years ago. And the first few days we had to, or the first two weeks, we had to plug it in outside the house. So we have this car plugged in outside the house. And if my husband or I were outside, every single neighbor would stop. And they would get out of their car. And they would say, what is that? <laughs> we'd say, it's a car. And they'd be like, does it have a gas pedal? <laughs> yes. Where did you buy it? <laughs> well, how, you know, what is it? And you know, they had all these questions. They're like, oh, that's so cool. And then when I saw them again, they'd actually roll down the window as they drove by. Like normally people don't roll down the window. They just wave like this because air conditioning, right? But they would actually roll down the window or push the button. They'd be like, I love your car. <laughs> so we were having a conversation there about something that they could do. And so I think with the carbon footprint, it's really important to talk about the experiences you've had yourself and what worked for you and how this is awesome and you really like this. And that's the way to kind of have that conversation. Not waving bony fingers at people. That is the worst way to have the conversation. If you have a tendency for the bony finger waving, retract it. <laughs> retract it. You can do it to yourself. You can do it in front of the mirror. You can pretend you're talking to the person. But when you see them in person, no bony fingers. Um, why don't we go over here? I'd like to build on that and then ask a question. So in San Jose, we're doing something called the Climate Smart San Jose Challenge. And it's people forming teams together to then reduce their carbon footprints in their own homes, but support each other. And we're finding that if they take action together, they're more likely to follow through and in inspire each other. And though Palo Alto has a similar yes, thing, like go right. Palo Alto carbon free. Yes. So I just want to put a plug in. We're helping Mothers Out Front. Our group is helping to launch this in San Jose. So, but my question is more about, back to this, what you talked about identity. I thought that was beautiful about how helping people see they can be more of who they really are mm -hmm. by taking action on climate. And I wanted to ask your advice. Our organization mobilizes mothers in particular to take action on climate. And what we find is mothers really care. They get the stakes, but they're super busy. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I'd want to be in your challenge, but I can't be a leader because I'm taking my kids to soccer. I can't. Yeah. There's just, they're so busy. Yeah. How can we get past that? We, we've reached some moms, but a lot of moms are just sitting back on the sidelines watching other people take action. How do we get more parents to see it's part of their parenting job to be a good parent, to take action in some way with other parents? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the answer is already in your question there, right? <laughs> yes. So, so if we're really convinced it matters to our kids, we'll do it. So I think that having people who have done it you know, really talk about why they did it and what a difference it makes and how they care about their kids and connect those dots is important. And also, too, you know, not everybody's available to lead something. So you have to really help people make it easy for them. And sometimes when people do one little thing, they're like, oh, that wasn't bad. Have you ever had that experience? I have it all the time. You have something that's weighing on you, and you feel like you should do it, and you really have to do it, and now it's really delayed, and you really need to do it, and they start feeling guilty, and they start avoiding it. And then sometimes you just do it, and you're like, oh my gosh, that was so easy. <laughs> so just really helping people do something easy and it really kind of helps often to get over a, a hump. And then also, when, when those people who have done it talk about it, really connecting the dots to our kids. I mean, I love so-and-so so much. This is what I care about them. And it's not just about today. It's about their future. And that's why I did this. And really making that connection very, very strong. As yeah. somebody who's increasingly in the grandparent generation, yes. one of the things I've observe frequently is that parents seem like they're so busy that it's really hard for them uh -huh. to focus on the longer term, mm -hmm. and that sometimes grandparents are better. Have you uh, run yes. into that? Yes, that's excellent. <laughs> Get the grandparents involved. That's really good. <laughs> OK, I, I see John here has had his hand up the whole time. Blue shirt. Mm -hmm. Ali. So I have a question on communities of faith for you, because you have more insight into that probably than anybody. Um, so you probably know Sally Bingham. 
Of course. Uh, Interfaith Power and Light, okay, who did the benediction for Steve Schneider's uh, 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 memorial bench, right? Mm -hmm. So some of what you've talked about in the faith community is the stewardship model, right? But there also seems to be a dominionist yeah. model mm -hmm. out there, right? That that seems to sort of say, no, you know, we, we own everything, so we can do what we want. Can you can you address those the, the sort of dichotomy in those communities? Because on the one side, you know, you get folks like like, like Interfaith Power and Light put um, solar panels on the on our local church, right? Mm -hmm. But the Dominionist side seems the other direction. So can you you know have you have you mm -hmm. gone into that community at all, or not? <laughs> I live in that community, John. <laughs> I, I came out of it to come to Stanford. <laughs> um, no, but th those are really good points. So let me distinguish between the two points that he raised. There are religious E sounding arguments, arguments that sound religious, but when you actually go to the actual theology of the religion, you find out it's not supported by the religion or by the Bible or by whatever it is. And then there's genuine religious or faith-based or theological arguments. And you provide an example of each one. So in terms of religious e sounding arguments, we hear them all the time. And in fact, um, I talk about some of them in the op-ed I wrote for the New York Times on Sunday. And I also talk about some of them in our most popular global weirding episode. I'm really surprised this is the most popular one. It's called, What Does the Bible Say About Climate Change? <laughs> That's the one everybody watches. So I go through the religious -y arguments. What are the religious -y arguments? They're arguments that sound religious. They sound, you know, very, oh, I respect God. God is in control. So humans can't affect the earth because God is in control. That sounds very respectful, right? How dare we, puny little humans, think that we could affect something that God is in charge of, right? That sounds very humble. Then there's, you know, God gave us dominion over the earth. So I'm respecting God's commandment. He gave it to us, so I'll, you know, dominion over the earth. And then there's, you know, the world will end anyway, so why does it matter? The Bible says the world will end anyway, so it doesn't matter. And then there's even ones like, you know, God said he would never flood the earth again, so clearly sea level can't be rising. And in response to that, don't pull out a map of the world back in the Cretaceous time to show that the entire planet can't be flooded even if all the ice caps melt, because then you'll jump into another hole. Um, so, but here's the interesting thing. When you actually, so if you don't, don't counter those arguments with science, because that's not where they come from. If you counter those arguments with what, for example, for Christians, the Bible actually says, it says, uh, for example, in Genesis 1, humans, or God gave humans responsibility, gave it to them. And then the word dominion is used in other places through the Bible, and when you look at it, it's very clear from the context, it's dominion, not domination. So there's even verses in the Bible where Jesus compares the rule of the godless who just extract all the wealth and leave smoking ruins behind them versus the, um, the dominion of the, of the godly who care for and grow and cause it to thrive. And even just from dominion, like imagine if somebody um, loved a piece of land and they had invested in that, that land and they had farms and they were um, putting carbon back into the soil and they had ecosystems that maintained the wildlife and they provided people with jobs on the farm and they'd invested everything into it and they said, I'm going to give you responsibility over this amazing piece of land that I've dedicated my life to. I'm going to give you sole responsibility and dominion over this land. Please take care of everything I love. And the Bible talks a lot about God's love for creation. So you take over this, this, this land with its farms, its people, its jobs, its ecosystems, and you run it into the ground. You just run it into the ground. You extract every penny of value. You leave it an absolute ruin that supports not a single iota of life, plant, animal, or human. What does that say about the person who gave that to you? Do you really love them? Do you really respect them? No. So you can address these, arg these arguments right on. And even in the Bible, back in those times, humans were humans. And there were people who were saying, oh, well, the world's going to end anyways, so just quit my job, lay back, fold my hands, wait for the world to end. And the Apostle Paul, who could be quite, um, quite direct, he wrote to those people, and he said, get a job, <laughs> support your family, care for the widows and the orphans, do what you're supposed to be doing, because you never know when the day or the time is, and you're supposed to be caring for other people in the meantime. So these are the religious -y sounding arguments that can actually be countered directly from the religion itself. But what are arguments that do work that really truly resonate? The stewardship argument is a very strong argument, the idea of caretaking or tending for the garden. But it doesn't resonate that strongly with everybody because 
there's a bit of a tendency for that to be heard as choosing plants and animals over people. And that connects directly to environmentalists, and that connects directly to people who, if they were driving down the road in their fully electric Prius, and they saw a baby seal and a baby human in the road, would swerve to avoid the baby seal first. <laughs> Not that anybody in this room would do that. <laughs> We'd swerve to avoid both of them, right? <laughs> um, but so there's this impression that you're like worshiping creation or esteeming creation over people and God. And that's why I found it to be very powerful to also, and depending on who you're talking to, connect the issue of climate change directly to life, directly to humans, directly to people who are suffering, directly to the poorest and the most disadvantaged in this world, right? Because that is who is being affected by a changing climate. And all of us, no matter what faith tradition we do or do not belong to, we understand instinctively and profoundly that that is not fair. And that, again, those of us who have the most, to whom the most has been given, have the most responsibility for others. And so that is a very profound motivator that directly, um, indirectly ad addresses people's concern that you only care about nature and not people, as if people could somehow live without nature. Right, which of course we can't. But I think it's really important to not only talk about, um, as they say, creation care is often a phrase that people use, but talk about creation care in the poor. So couple those two concepts together. If it's okay with you, Catherine, and Yay. it's okay with you, we'll go for about 10 more minutes. So that'll probably be time sure. for maybe three more questions. We haven't had anybody from the back and this Way side. back, yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could comment briefly on whether you see capitalism as being compatible with a sustainable future, because it seems like there are certain incentives created by a capitalist system, like driving up consumerism that will always be obstacles to sustainability and perhaps kind of conversely there are certain practices that um, like the share economy for instance that might not be explicitly pro-environment but which nevertheless may have positive um, impacts on the environment. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's no question that we have to, um, we have to move towards a sustainable circular economy. The interesting thing is this. So for a long time in the history of our civilization, we could effectively treat the earth, the atmosphere, and the ocean as infinite. We could. Because there were so few of us compared to the size of the earth that we could effectively treat the resources as infinite. When you ran out of resources or space, there were new continents to move to. There were new places to go. There were new sources of wealth. Those days are done. You're probably familiar with the planetary boundaries concept. Johann Rockström pioneered the idea that there are boundaries on our resources. I mean, we live on a finite planet. There is not enough to go around at the rate we're using it generation after generation. So there is no alternative to the fact that we have to figure out how to live within our boundaries, and we haven't been doing that. But at the same time, I have heard people say, well, let's fix capitalism first. <laughs> or let's just fix Citizens United first. Or let's just fix X first. Let's fix science education first. And then we can fix climate change. I'm like, it is too late. That ship has sailed. We have to fix it with what we have. And in the process of doing so, we will change the world. And we will change our economy. So we need free market mechanisms. We need market-based mechanisms. We need solutions from across the political spectrum that employ the tools we have today. But by implementing those solutions, we are moving ourselves towards that sustainable future. Chris, what do you think? You must think about this a lot. Uh, I was going to say exactly the same thing huh. that, that you said. I, you know, the, the way I look at it is that there are lots of things that could be done if we had a different relationship to production. But there are lots of things that could be done with the relationships we have now. And I think we ought to be pursuing both. We mm -hmm. ought to be taking best advantage of the ones that go the most quickly. A couple more questions. Over Maybe here up the in the side. front here. Yeah. We My name is Bill. Um, I believe the vast majority of Americans now do believe that climate change is happening and is being caused by humans. I believe that a very, very small percentage of those people understand how bad it's going to be, how fast. 
they don't get the connection between climate change and the lives that their children are going to be living 30, 40, 50 years from now. Or if they're young adults, the lives they will be living. I don't think they see that. I haven't heard, heard one thing about that in this talk or in almost any of the articles I read. And it doesn't get that specific. And I know you can't be specific because the answer is going to be different for people in Bangladesh versus people in Portland, Oregon. But in general, um, 30, 40, 50 years from now, is it going to be that bad? And if so, uh -huh. why aren't we saying so? Why aren't we getting that out? To me, that's the great failure of climate activism. Well, um, your question is, um, is one that um, addresses one of my key frustrations. And that is the fact that I just finished serving as a lead author, and quite a few other people at Stanford did too, on a 1,600-page document that lays out in excruciating, gory detail what a higher versus a lower future will do to every region of the US, every sector of the US, every aspect of our resources, specific cities, our coasts, islands, national security, international relationships, food, water, health, infrastructure, <laughs> the National Climate Assessment, which is currently on version four. So we have four national climate assessments that go into detail. Here's what's happening in Boston. Here's what's happening in New York. Here's what's happening in Sacramento. Then you get to California. We did that study now over 15 years ago where we looked at the difference between a higher versus lower future for California. And then there were how many governor's reports? Uh, California's on its third. A third governor report that goes through and looks at agriculture, water, air quality, infrastructure, economy, health in California by city. We did projections of where, of how Sacramento, the climate of Sacramento would move to Death Valley under a higher scenario. How, um, you know, LA would be moving into Mexico. So, so your question addresses a key frustration I feel like we both have is, how the heck do we get this information to people? <laughs> because we have it, this is what we do, and we try to do all the outreach we can. I make global weirding episodes to go with every single section of the National Climate Assessment. We all, all of us authors do as many interviews as we can. We do speaking engagements, we do workshops, stakeholder engagement. We have all of this information and it's not a case of using the information to change people's minds, it's getting it to people who want the information, right? So w that's why we need everybody. We scientists are not communication experts. We're generally not activists. We're not um, people who are experts in different sectors. We need everybody to help use the information we've generated as well as help us generate more relevant information to get that to people who need it. Because you are totally right. I mean, when you look at the Yale climate opinion maps, which I talked about earlier, and you ask pe people, do you think it's real? Do you think it's affecting plants and animals in future generations? Everybody says yes. And then you say, do you think it affects people in the US? Most people say sort of yes. And then you say, do you think it will affect you personally? Everybody says no. So that information is not getting out, and it is not for lack of the scientific community doing it. It's for, because we have all of these barriers towards getting this information out, and part of it is our, our news media that just thrives off sound bites. Let me jump in with oh, a quick yeah, yeah, follow-up. Yeah. Please, and, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think is an important challenge that we mm -hmm. face in getting the real messages out is avoiding a sense of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you find the right mm -hmm. balance between characterizing the seriousness of the situation we're in without leaving people feeling hopeless? Oh, now that's the money question right there, yes. Um, so some of you may be familiar with a book called The Uninhabitable Earth. Yes, David Wallace Wells. David and I actually had a conversation at Climate One in San Francisco back in January, or back in May, if you're interested. And David wrote this book that basically laid out just how horrible it was. So in answer to your, actually your question, the uninhabitable earth lays it out in spades. Right. And, well, no, here's the interesting thing. So I had a conversation with David about it. And in his conversation, I was shocked to hear him basically say, didn't really change my life. He wrote the book. <laughs> he wrote it and it didn't change his life. He kind of felt like, well, what can I do about it anyways? So that's why I think the hope, the rational hope, 
not Pollyanna hope based on false hope or false solutions or the idea that one solution will save us all, but a rational hope that acknowledges it is bad and it is getting worse. And there's some impacts we can't avoid because they're already here or they're already in the pipeline. But there is hope that we can fix it. We have to have that hope because without the hope, we will be a self-fulfilling prophecy of despair. Because what does fear do? Fear motivates us to immediate, short-term, adrenaline-fueled action, which leads us to burn out. And climate anxiety is a very real thing. We've run experiments with students that were exposed to a lot of information about how bad it was. It didn't move them towards more concerned. They dropped off the end. They couldn't even stand that level of anxiety, so they just disassociated. Why? Because they didn't have the hope. What does the hope look like? The number one thing I think we are missing that we scientists cannot give you is a vision of a better future. We need the visionaries, the creators, the artists. We need the, the people who look at innovation and concepts and vision. We need a vision of a better future because we are currently trying to drive the car without a goal other than reducing carbon. So our goal is negative. We need a positive goal. We don't just need the goal of how much weight we're going to lose. We need the vision of what we'll accomplish by doing so. We need that positive vision of a future. And to inspire us to get there, we need stories of hope. And those, those stories are not going to find us. Because the entire media system is set up around bad news. The horrible thing that happened, the terrible thing so-and-so said, can you believe the latest thing on Twitter? How horrible, awful, enraging, frustrating it is. But the stories of hope are out there. And so I actually go and I look for those stories. I share them with people. I track the um, feedback on social media. And I find out that the hopeful stories have the biggest feedback. The most number of people like and share those stories. So part of our job talking to people is to look for hope and to share those little tiny hopeful stories with people so that when you go away, you feel like, wow, the world really can change. And I want to give you a hopeful story as an example. Here's one. And I'm actually writing a book now called Talking Climate. And so if you have a hopeful story about a conversation you've had, please do send it to me through my website, katherinehayhoe.com. I'm collecting your stories. So here's my story. So in December last year, my TED Talk was released about how talking about climate change is one of the most important things we can do, because no one does. And if you don't talk about it, why would you care? And if you don't care, why would you act? So I don't mean talking about the science. I mean talking about why it matters to us and the places where we live and what are some hopeful stories about things we can do, things other people are doing, things that we can support. So my TED Talk came out in December. And in the following May, this past May, I had collected enough of a critical mass to go to the UK to do a bunch of talks in a bunch of different places. So I was giving a talk at the London School of Economics. And a community member, an older man, came up to me afterwards. And he said, I've taken the train in from this little town I live in outside of London to hear your talk because I watched your TED Talk. And ever since I watched your TED Talk, I've been having conversations. Oh, that's awesome. He said, I've got a list of all the conversations that we've had in my town. Would you like to see the list? <laughs> I'm like, yes, I would love to see it. And so he reaches in his bag, and he pulls out this, this sheaf of papers. And I was expecting, you know, I don't know, 70, 80 names. He pulls out a sheaf of papers with 10,000 names. <laughs> it had 10,000 conversations in five months. And he said, as a result of these conversations, our city council just voted to declare a climate emergency. And so I just emailed him the other day, and I said, Glenn, could I tell your story in my book? And he said, sure, but we're at 11,800 now. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And everybody, please join me in thanking Catherine Hale, not only for a fabulous conversation, <laughs> but also for her leadership on the defining issue of our era.